Hey guys, Greg Chaplin here, physical therapist and strength and conditioning specialist. In this video, I'm gonna teach you everything you need to know about pelvic motion in just five minutes. So we're gonna cover a lot of information and we're gonna go quick, so hang in there. And without further ado, let's jump right in. Okay guys, so here's Lucy and she's my pelvis model. She's Lucy because she's Lucy Goosey. She's gonna help us describe these pelvic motions that we're gonna learn today in the video. Now in general, we're gonna have two main types of pelvic motion. One is gonna be motion within the pelvis. So motion between the sacrum bone and the ilium, that's called intrapelvic motion or referred to as relative motion within the pelvis. On the flip side, we're gonna have movement of the entire pelvis as a unit. and We're gonna call that pelvic orientation. Now we're gonna know that we have relative motion available when we have close to the full amount of hip range of motion. We use internal and external rotation as an example. We would expect to have a combined 90 to 100 degrees. If we have less than that, we likely don't have full access to the relative motions. If we do have the full 90 to 100 degrees, we probably have access to those relative motions. Now, when it comes to these relative motions within the pelvis, we have movement between the sacrum bone here and the ilium, and then we're gonna have associated motions that happen in the lumbar spine at the hip, and we're gonna focus on the motions between the sacrum and the ilium. So when we talk about relative motions of the ilium relative to the sacrum, we're gonna have linked motions due to the shape of the sacroiliac joint. So as we take these two bones here, we bring them together in what would be considered adduction. We're also gonna get a posterior rotation or extension of that ilium as well. And we're gonna get this transverse plane rotation of internal rotation. For the sake of our conversation, let's call this internal rotation of the ilium. Then on the flip side, when we have these two bones moving away from each other into what would be considered abduction, we're also going to have a forward movement of the ilium, which would be called flexion. And then we're also going to have this transverse plane rotation called external rotation. For the sake of our discussion, let's call this external rotation. So to review, we have internal and external rotation of the ilium bones. So now if we look at the sacrum, we're gonna have two main motions. We're gonna have nutation and counter-nutation. As the tailbone moves back and the base of the sacrum moves forward, that is considered to be nutation of the sacrum. If we tuck the tailbone under and move this upper or base of the sacrum back, that's gonna be considered counter-nutation. When we go into nutation or this forward position here, that's gonna be associated with internal rotation at the ilium. When we go into the counter nutated position, that's gonna be associated with external rotation of the ilium. So real quick to recap, we have movement happening between the sacrum and the ilium. When that sacrum goes into a nutated position, we have internal rotation of the ilium. When we go into a counter nutated position through the sacrum, we have external rotation of the ilium. Now it should be noted that when we're walking, we're gonna have one side going into internal rotation while the other goes into external rotation and one side of the sacrum going into nutation while the other side goes into counter nutation, then that's gonna alternate. The weight bearing side is typically going to be to the side that's going into nutation and then that's going to move towards counter nutation as the other side moves from counter nutation towards nutation. So now that we've discussed these relative motions within the pelvis, let's discuss the movement of the entire pelvis as a unit or orientation of the pelvis. So when we talk about orientation of the pelvis, we're talking about a forward movement of the pelvis happening somewhere in the pelvis, either on a straight ahead kind of an axis or on an oblique axis, and either one aspect of the pelvis moving forward more than the other or the entire pelvis moving equally forward. So we're gonna go through a number of these pelvic orientations in a rather rapid fire manner, so hang on tight. And just to review, we know we have an orientation when that total hip excursion is less than what we would expect. So if we took the internal and external rotation measurements as an example, if we expected a combined 90 to 100 degrees between the two, and we have less than that, then we'd likely have some type of a pelvic orientation. Okay, so anterior pelvic tilt. The top half of the pelvis moves forward more than the bottom half of the pelvis. This is typically gonna increase the amount of lumbar lordosis or natural arched kind of a curve in the low back. Now for posterior tilt, we're gonna have the lower half of the pelvis moving forward more than the upper half of the pelvis. This is gonna be characteristic of someone that would be in a sway back position. These people also usually have a pretty tight lower posterior aspect of the pelvis as well. Then we have good old fashioned anterior orientation of the pelvis, which is a movement of the entire pelvis as a unit forward, but no aspect of the pelvis necessarily tipping more than the other. So there's no tilt happening here, but the entire pelvis is moving forward as a unit. 
Then we have lateral pelvic tilt, which typically involves one side moving forward more than the other, and then a shift towards either the left or right sides. So typically the left side is gonna be moving further forward than the right side, at least initially, but it's going to depend on the axis of rotation. So if we have this up and over kind of movement and then a shift towards the left, we're gonna see a left pelvic tilt. And then if we have more of a push over toward the right side, and then a shift towards that side, we're gonna have a right pelvic tilt. So if we're up and over and then shifted to the left, left pelvic tilt, if we get pushed from the back of the left and then shift over to the right, right lateral pelvic tilt. Okay, so now a quick bonus. If we want to actually restore the relative motions, we have to reduce whatever orientation we have. So we need to figure out what's moving forward in space, and then we have to move that back in space by selecting an appropriate activity. Now, for example, if we have an anterior pelvic tilt, top half of the pelvis is moving forward more than the lower half of the pelvis, we're gonna select an activity like a heels elevated goblet squat, which is gonna help us bring the top half of the pelvis back more than the bottom half, and you can see that here. Now on the flip side, if we have a posterior pelvic tilt, sway back type position, where the lower aspect of the pelvis is coming forward more than the upper half, we need to move the lower half of the pelvis further back than the upper half of the pelvis. And this is where a hinging activity, especially a unilateral or one-sided hinging activity can come into handy. As you can see here, we're moving the lower half of the pelvis back more than the upper half. Okay guys, so there you have it. We explained everything that you need to know about pelvic motion in just five minutes. Whew and now we can relax. But if you have any questions at all, or if you learned something, please leave me a comment below. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you'll know I upload a new video. And until next time, thanks a lot for watching. Peace.